Hi, this is Amy Proal with the PolyBio podcast, and my guest today is Alessio Fasano. He's an MD, and he's the W. Allen Walker Chair of Pediatric Gastro and Test uh, Gastro Enterology and Nutrition and Chief of the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition at Mass General Hospital for Children. And he is also the director of the Mucosal Immunology and Biology Research Center at Mass General. His research focuses on the molecular mechanisms by which bacterial pathogenesis, activity of the gut microbiome, and intestinal mucosal biology impact the development of chronic inflammatory conditions such as celiac disease. And as part of this research, he discovered zonulin, a protein responsible for regulating intestinal tight junctions. And recently, he turned this expertise to the study of multi-system inflammatory syndrome, a life-threatening illness that can develop in children weeks after exposure to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And with that, Alessio, welcome, and thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, Amy, for having me on your um, podcast. No, it's exciting to have you on because I read your study on multi-system inflammatory syndrome, and I work with a nonprofit that is doing a number of research studies, a few at uh, Harvard MGH to study patients with long COVID and also myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, another condition initiated and exacerbated by infection. So that study really rang of great interest to me because we're interested in gut reservoir of some of the viruses that contribute to the disease process. And with that, I think I should just let you describe the study a little bit more and tell the audience what what you found. Can you explain um, what you were studying in MIS-C and what you identified? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> of course, you know, this is a fruit of a serendipitous journey because as you know, when we were hit big time with COVID in the beginning of 2020, uh, the entire hospital, including the labs, were shut down and repurposed um, just specifically to help with the COVID-19 pandemics. And, and for that reason, we start, you know, to really refocus our line of research and try to contribute for whatever we could to help with some of the issues related to COVID-19 and its complication. Uh, being a pediatrician by training, uh, together with um, many of my colleagues and, you know, and, and with the leadership of Leo Yonker, that is one of our junior faculty uh, in uh, pulmonology, we set up this uh, biobank for pediatric COVID. At that time, you know, there are a lot of people that believe that, you know, COVID was sparing kids, that kids were not involved in this. Of course, that would be a first because we know that the viral infection will find further terrain in kids. And long story short, you know, not only they are infected, they can not only share this virus and contribute to um, the pandemics, but they can, you know, suffer of a severe consequences, including this syndrome uh, that for short uh, is called MIS-C, that is even if it's rare, it's life-threatening because, you know, affect, you know, noble organs like uh, the heart, uh, the, the, the lungs, and of course the brain and so on and so forth. Um, how we got to wherever we are uh, is that we realized uh, together with other investigators that while the port of entry and the first encounter with the virus is through the airways, um, after a few days, the virus find this biological niche in the GI tract. It sit there for weeks, sometimes for months, and we didn't know what was doing there. Um, when you have a new uh, inhabitant in the ecosystem of the gut, uh, the, this ecosystem that you mentioned being called the microbiome definitely has to rearrange to accommodate these new comers. Um, and when these comers are bossy and they eventually really change the nice equilibrium, you know, the, this, this, this you know, the cross checks that we have in the ecosystem, you know, you may have consequences. Anyhow, the, the bottom line is that MISI is a condition that is fueled by a storm of these chemicals that we call cytokines that eventually offend this, you know, organs. And we didn't understand where the storm was coming from and how this was instigated, because as hard as we look, viral particles are not present in the blood of these kids. They are not there. So how did that happen? If these kids eventually had no symptoms whatsoever, or if they did have symptoms related to COVID infection, the preceding weeks and weeks of the onset of this complication. And this, what I'm saying, applies to long COVID as well, by the way. So um, 
what we realized, and, and this was the, the results of this study, is that one, indeed, the virus sits there. Two, because creating an imbalance of the ecosystem of this microbiome, as a consequence, activates this pathway that we discovered a while ago that you mentioned before that's called zonulin, that really controlled the leakness of the gut, if you wish, and therefore the trafficking of stuff from the gut lumen into the bloodstream. The third thing that we realized is that because the, the SARS-CoV-2 causes zone release, as a consequence, one of the key elements of the virus, very famous to all of us, this famous spike protein, uh, really comes into the bloodstream. And together with some colleagues from uh, um, UCLA, um, um, Cedar Sinai, I'm sorry, from LA, um, we discovered this, this uh, you know, um, spike is what we call a super antigen. In other words, an antigen is capable to induce autoimmunity. And with that, cytokine storm. So long story short, what we discovered is that there are these steps. Step number one, you're infecting the airways. A few days and goes away. Step number two, the virus goes into the um, niche of the GI tract. Step number three, this virus there induced this release of this molecule zone and then makes the intestine leakier and the, the spike protein got into the bloodstream. At that point, this spike protein will interact with some immune cells and you have to be genetically predisposed to do so. That's the reason why only a small group of kids will eventually develop this complication to engage the immune system and create this cytokine storm. And step number five, finally, you have then the inflammation in the lung and the heart and so on and so forth. Because of that, and because as you mentioned um, at the beginning of my introduction, we've been working now for years on this, um, you know, mechanisms of, of microbiome induced, you know, inflammation that can lead to autoimmune disease, including celiac. We had the opportunity to leverage on, on ongoing studies to block this zoning pathway and therefore this trafficking with a molecule that we call lorazidide. And, you know, we had one kid with Missy that was severely sick and we obtained from the FDA, the compassionate use of lorazidide of these kids. And he did extremely well, despite that we threw to him everything that was available and we could not fix the problem. Following this case, we had another four kids with Missy that also we got approved by the FDA to have the use of lorazidide for compassionate use with the same kind of results, shorten the, the time they could be in the hospital, prevent them to go in intensive care unit, protect, in other words, these you know, organs that are target of the cytokine storm. And therefore, and to finish this story, uh, thanks to this and thanks to this publication, the FDA approved us uh, for a double blind phase two study that is ongoing right now. That's pretty much the story. So it's a serendipity 360 degrees, if you wish. That's amazing. That's quite a story. It's a very important study. It's interesting because I followed your work for a while. I followed your work before on celiac disease and gut microbiome, and I was already aware of your findings with zonulin. And it really is interesting how you just drew that right in now to Miss C. Um, now, also, I just was when I was looking at your papers before the lorazotide that can block the zonulin expression that also you think might have antiviral properties as well? So um, again, another story, um, <laughs> viral story of, of, of um, serendipity. And this is the results of, it. again, I want to shout out here to the entire worldwide scientific community that come to rescue to really face this situation. Among the others, you know, a lot of chemists, experts in chemistry have been looking at what, can be used that is already in our toolbox uh, to fight the, you know, this virus. Of course, we know that the, the unbelievable story of the vaccines. Uh, again, before moving to Boston, I was in Maryland working in a place called Center for Vaccine Development. And I've been there for 20 years. And if somebody would have told me, there is gonna be some point in life that you will see a vaccine that will be produced within a year, I would say you must be totally out of your mind. Because, you know, even now, you know, it takes six, seven years to develop a vaccine if everything goes well. But anyhow, the bottom line is a lot of these chemists would have done 
try to repurpose molecules that are already on the market or used for other purposes because we all realize, and you know, this next, this current, you know, flare up of the pandemic. So in other words, this other wave is teaching us a lesson. We're not gonna get out of this just with a vaccine. We need antivirals that will, in together with the vaccine, will stop the spreading of the virus. And, you know, people that were trying to look at molecules to see if there are any molecules out there that can be antiviral molecules. And among these chemists, there's one that is working in our research institute in Italy that's called Ebris. We have a sort of, of, of hub of the MGH in, in Italy. Um, and he, the, the, you know, discovered that Zlarazodide has a, a, a motif that can block a key protein of the virus that is important for the virus to replicate. So it's like that you stuck, you know, this virus, you know, in, in a cell. And again, I don't want to go too technical, but, you know, viruses, they work in a very economy. They don't have a huge amount of genetic information material. What they do, they have the essential they bring with them, and then they hijacked, you know, machinery from, you know, the, the, the host they are trying to, uh, you know, um, infect. So in the case of SARS-CoV-2, this virus needs to get into a cell, our way, so GI tract, and hijack the machinery there to allow itself to um, replicate and then spread. And the first step to do that is an enzyme without which the virus cannot replicate and therefore spread. And lorazotide turns to have a capability to block that enzyme. And, you know, independently, two more groups, one in Germany and the other one in, uh, in China, looking again at these billions of molecules that are out there, find out independently that lorazotide can indeed be an inhibitor for you know, this molecule. Mm -hmm. We've done studies, we have refined lorazotide, now there's a next generation. So what we're using is not lorazotide, but the next generation that is more efficient in getting into the cell and therefore to you know, achieve that goal. And we've done in vitro studies showing that it works exactly the way it's supposed to. We've done crystallography studies showing that indeed this enzyme is blocked. And now we are doing in vivo study in animals so that we can eventually um, move on to the next step. That will be to formulate this molecule as a nasal spray that you spray so that, you know, as soon as you get infected or you are in contact with somebody, you will have a couple of poofs and the virus, you know, dies there. Um, cheap stable with the temperature so you don't have to go to a, a, a cold chain. And this can be deployed worldwide very, very quickly because it's not that expensive to produce. Wow, that's incredible. And a nasal spray formulation makes incredible sense. I agree with you. And just to reiterate, then there's some chance that the lorazotide might have activity in preventing um, in simple terms, leaky gut or intestinal permeability and potentially have antiviral activity against us. That's right. The, the, the derivative of lorazolide, the part of it, will have yeah. this, this antiviral effect. Yes. That's a very good mix of uh, potential properties for uh, treating MIS-C. Um, now, you mentioned long COVID before, and you did already say that you think some of these findings can inform long COVID. I mean, we definitely, we're even working with a team that's trying to collect intestinal tissue from long COVID patients to see if the virus may still be there. Um, and a couple other studies like that, a, a focus on, again, viral reservoir and long COVID. So yes, um, do you think a similar phenomenon could be occurring in some patients with long COVID? Perhaps not, not as much spike or as much inflammation, but some level of that. I, I think that again, uh, um, with, with a caveat and the disclaimer that we are building this airplane while we're flying. So yes. we may be wrong in all yes. these hypotheses. I truly believe that long COVID will be the consequence of two things. One, that again, the virus find a way to, you know, stay there for a long time. And two, that eventually, um, you know, the um, host is genetically predisposed to eventually uh, respond to this, you know, long interaction with this virus by um, generating an inappropriate, uh, you know, immune response. And when you, you fight, there is always collateral damage, there is inflammation that eventually will target these organs. And therefore you may eventually, I don't know, 
develop asthma, for example, because you were genetically predisposed to do so. And now this virus does this. Because again, some of the components, including spike, can induce an, an autoimmune disease, you can develop an autoimmune disease. And, and I believe that, again, we always have been hypothesized that the trigger autoimmunity on people that are genetically predisposed are infections, particularly virus infection. This SARS-CoV-2 with the spike protein being a super antigen, that again is one of the ways that you develop autoimmunity, um, it really shows that indeed, this is not an hypothesis anymore, but it's a, a, a clear evidence that suggests if we go and try to be preemptive, um, fighting against the virus, we may eventually you know, mitigate the long COVID and its consequences with chronic fatigue, with, you know, asthma, with, you know, fibromyalgia or whatever has been described so far. But most importantly, again, uh, we may eventually even prevent it. So you have disease interception. So people, they don't have to develop this as a consequence of COVID. I'm going to finish by saying, and I don't want to send pessimistic here, we are near now the third reiteration of God knows how many other reiteration of mutation of this virus. This one, the Omicron, is showing to that despite that seems to be less severe in terms of mortality, um, has a huge penetrance. I'm afraid that we all we got infected at some point with this. And, and therefore, there's even more an urgency to really focus on what to do about the possible long COVID. If indeed the destiny is that we all, or the vast majority of us will be infected by, by, by the Omicron variant. Yes, absolutely. Because a lot of long COVID patients are developing the disease after just mild or asymptomatic cases. And that's similar to Miss C, in which the original infection, the children often are asymptomatic at the time of acute COVID, and then go on to develop the whole series of events that you just described, right? So- the, unfortunately, Omicron potentially being more mild, if that's the case, doesn't necessarily mean that any of that will not happen. And also, I worry slightly that because Omicron has evaded the immune response better, that it may actually be a little harder to clear. So if we're worried that reservoir of the virus may be contributing to persistent spike leakage or any of these issues, that may be a problem with Omicron as well. Again, very speculative, you don't know, but in other words, uh, there's no reason not to continue to study long COVID and miss C with as much energy as ever under conditions of, you know, Omicron. Um, I, I mean, you know, again, you're right. We don't know for sure, but I'm afraid that you have, you know, a, a, a very valid arguments on the table here. <clears throat> you know, again, um, if indeed we have evidence as we do that the SARS-CoV-2 will eventually lead in a subgroup of individual with um, you know, um, genetic predisposition to long COVID consequences. And because Omicron is so effective uh, to really spread from one individual to another because it replicates very, very fast, you know, uh, every 36, 8, 48 hours it replicates compared to the Delta variant, the original one that takes five, six days. Um, you know, again, uh, my prediction is that of the seven billion people that we are, a good junk will be exposed to this. And it's a matter of probability that, you know, some of these people will pay consequences. So yeah, on one end, it's reassuring is less virulent so that eventually it's like a natural, you know, vaccination that you got if you're infected. But on the other hand, how do we know? Where is the price that we as a community will end up to pay uh, in terms of long COVID? So, um, you know, I share your, 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 your concerns there. And, and again, the game is not over yet because I'm pretty sure that, you know, with the spreading of Omicron, other variants will come on board and God knows what we're going to deal with. History is telling us, and this has been, you know, like during the Spanish flu and so on and so forth, that, you know, passage up for passage, you know, these viruses, they tend to become less and less virulent until we become a season of, you know, inf infection. And, and that's totally fine. But, you know, how do we know that we're not dealing with um, like the herpes zoster that sits in our nerves and that will become shingled, you know, decades later? We don't know. We don't know. No, especially not because with MECFS, a condition that we work with in which most cases are initiated by other viral infections, some of them are initiated by those seasonal influenza or enterovirus cases that, you know, are just 
considered normal and yet do drive chronic disease in a subset of patients. So yeah, I don't think we can let our guard down on even during uh, that kind of possibility. You know, separately, you've mentioned autoimmunity a couple of times. Um, when you talk about autoimmunity, the spike protein, what's going on with SARS-CoV-2, do you mean uh, autoimmunity via molecular mimicry that perhaps when the immune system recognizes the spike protein or related SARS-CoV-2 antigen, there's enough similarity in size and shape and the immune system starts to fire on human tissues or receptors? Do you think that's a mechanism or do you think the immune system just... What's the mechanisms in terms yeah. of autoimmunity? So, so, so again, I don't want to go too dark technical, but there are several non mutually exclusive theory of autoimmunity. One is antigen mimicry. So in other words, yeah. these viruses, they have particles, they are structurally so similar to ours that the immune system intend to fight this enemy, but now start to target your own body. And then there is the bystander effect, i.e. that you know the infection will, will destroy your cells and, and leak stuff out of the cell and this stuff that never be seen by the immune system, you know, um, uh, you know, will eventually be targeted and therefore you develop in that way. The super antigen is a third possible way that you activate autoimmunity. So it, 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 it is a, again, I don't want to go too much in details, but you know, um, the, 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 the autoimmunity is, is it's this trigger when there is this interaction between a subgroup of immune cells here called T lymphocytes and another group that are, you know, and so that it works like, you know, antigen presenter cells, another subgroup of, 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 of immune cells, they, are, they, they, they have to interact to their receptors and they are co-molecules that are needed so that they lock them you know, uh, and, and therefore they can cross talk and present and create the, the syndicate for autoimmunity. The super antigen will not require that, you know, um, presenting molecule. They do both. They will be the target of the immune response, but they also works as, you know, cofactor to make these two to talk. So it's like to say, come to my table and talk. And you know, in doing so, they favor the expansion of the immune cells that will eventually lead to autoimmunity. That's the way that we understand how super antigen works. And the spike turns to be such a molecule. Wow, yeah, the spike protein definitely is just a very interesting uh, yeah. antigen. Yes, that's for sure. When you mentioned genetics um, and obviously how all of us have different uh, human genes that can predispose towards how the environment then impacts us. Um, are you looking at any particular human genome variants um, specifically for those that you think can augment the pathology of MIS-C along the lines of what you're noting? Um, which, yeah, in other words, which what's the yeah, genetics? We we end up to <laughs> we end up to find out that you know again this this uh, lymph T lymphocytes. Uh, you know, to lock with these other immune cells using this, this, this molecule that is called T cell receptor mm -hmm. or TCR for short. Right. And there is a fixed, you know, part of this part, and then there is a variable part. Bottom line is mutation of the TCR, the T cell receptor that locks in to the, to, with these other immune cells to create the expansion is one is mutated. There's a specific mutation of TCR that created the syndicate to increase risk for missing. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. Yes. Yep. Okay, and definitely, and in long COVID, where you don't necessarily have this hyperinflammatory response that becomes deadly, because um, missing can actually become truly severe. Um, there may be variants, for example, um, similar variants, I suppose, but also, for example, I'm not sure if you looked at all at the spike as a super antigen being able to catalyze clotting and coagulatory processes. I That's know you've right. shown that net formation can occur, which of course then can impact the vasculature, the blood vessels. Um, do you think there's some other aspects of what spike is doing in that arena? Yeah, and it's not just spike, you know, there mm -hmm. are the molecules of the variant that have been you know, uh, shown to have that kind of capability, and and probably they play a role in in um, in in long COVID. So definitely, um, if you are genetically predisposed, and now you have these instigators coming in, um, you may eventually uh, be in a situation which you know you switch from genetic predisposition to clinical outcome, and you develop these conditions. Totally yes. 
Also, do you think that the state of the microbiome at the time of infection with SARS-CoV-2 serves as a form of predisposition, especially in the gut? In other words, if it's already imbalanced or dysbiotic and then a child is infected with SARS-CoV-2, there may already be a, you know, expression of zonulin. There may already be, you know, imbalance that can then make it just that easier for this, the process driven by SARS-CoV-2 um, and spike leakage to occur. Yeah, I, I'm going to give you a, a biased answer here because, of course, you know, this is what I do for a living. And, you know, with Susie Flaherty, we wrote recently this book that's called Gut Feelings that yes. gives an overview of what the microbiome is. And if you have the chance to look in this, this book, a, a recurring motif is that one of the key elements of the microbiome is really to instruct the immune system to decide if, why, when, and how to unleash inflammation. Uh, and therefore, if you have an imbalanced microbiome to start with, this will definitely have an impingement on your immune system that maybe will be prepared to fight and to be more you know, crisp and aggressive and belligerent. So uh, once you and then you be affected by the infection with SARS-CoV-2, and now you have an imbalanced microbiome to start with, the chance of to pay consequences with an immune response that leads to MIS-C or, or, or long COVID would be much higher. That, that would be my, my prediction. This is technically called epigenetics. So, you know, we know that if you have the genes to develop, I don't know, fibromyalgia or fi Parkinson or the breast cancer, that's not destiny that you would develop this condition. If you do, do not depends on how you play your genetic cards. And this seems to be through the microbiome that is the transducer of your lifestyle. Uh, you, know, you know, the way that you live, uh, the, the way that you eat, the way that you eventually deal with stress and so on and so forth, they can eventually impinge on the microbiome that in turn epigenetic can switch these genes on and off and, and, and start the march from genetic predisposition to clinical outcome. Absolutely. I really like that description of, you know, the genetics determines how you play your cards with the environment. That's a great way to talk about it. Um, in that sense, you know, right now when someone, you know, gets COVID, we say there's not much you can do, but I do tell people because I'm a microbiome, uh, that's what my uh, graduate work was on too, microbiome. Like, you know, it can't hurt you to try to make sure that your microbiome is in decent shape. Um, do you think that we should have a bigger push to be helping people make dietary changes or you name it, any kind of microbiome-based therapeutics that we should be increasingly just, uh, you know, the population should be getting, becoming more aware of during this time so that we can keep the microbiome in a better place so that we can, you know, prevent that sort of uh, predisposition you were just uh, speaking about? So, Amy, it would be a shame if we don't learn the lesson, the hard lesson that we learned this, this pandemics. We lost an unbelievable number of lives. And who succumbed to the uh, pandemics? The people that had preconditions. You know, there are people that have, you know, cardiovascular diseases, people that had metabolic disorder like type 2 diabetes, people that were overweight, elderly. What are the common denominators there? You know, inappropriate lifestyle that put them at risk. And all these conditions are related to an imbalanced microbiome. So the, the, the long hanging fruit, if you want to really try to minimize the risk to pay a consequences, you know, not only to SARS-CoV-2, but anything that life throws to you in terms of infections, in terms of inflammation and so on and so forth, is to have your microbiome to be a friend an ally rather than, you know, a enemy. And, you know, uh, you know, of all the things that affect the microbiome, the, the way that you're born with C-section vaginal delivery, if you've been born preterm, the lifestyle of your mom, if it's, she's a rural or, or, or urban, you know, lifestyle, smoking and so on and so forth. These are point events, but the ones that are extremely impactful is nutrition because you eat three times, four times a day, and nutrition really, really affects the composition and therefore the, 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 the function of the microbiome. The way that I typically explain to my students this concept is imagine the microbiome as sort of a farm. So you have the cow, you have the chickens, you have the, you know, the horses, you have the, 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 the pigs and so on and so forth. They eat different things. And you want a farm with all these animals. 
Now, if you don't eat, you know, well, and in terms of not only quantity, but quality, guess what? The chance that you will not, I don't know, feed the chicken correctly and they will die. Therefore, your farm will not make eggs. So you're going to pay consequences. So um, it's not just because, you know, it is appropriate to eat so that you will be fit and we prevent, the, you know, type 2 diabetes and, and, and so on and so forth. But also, I'm assuming that, you know, you will be able to develop an MS, for example, not just because you have your genes that put you at risk, but because you have a lifestyle, including your nutrition, that is inappropriate. So you don't have that check balance of the microbiome. And the consequence is some bossy individual will come in, particularly as a consequence of an infection like a viral infection with SARS-CoV-2, that as you may suggesting, starting already from a, 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 a precarious, unbalanced situation of a microbiome that is off balance, now this is the perfect story. Yes, I agree. I agree very much. And I think it's interesting that you mentioned, uh, you know, microbiome in areas beyond just the gut, because when I started in microbiome research, obviously the focus was on the gut, oral microbiome came in a little bit afterwards, but then you just mentioned breast milk microbiome, for example, and I know you've done work on blood microbiome in patients with, with celiac disease. So in other words, these organisms, um, you know, can definitely persist in an, in a collective fashion, not just in the gut and mouth. And I think with breast milk, uh, will you explain a little bit more there? So you can actually, the mother can actually sort of can pass. In other words, you can inherit um, microbiome. So we have inherited human genetics, but we also have inherited microbiome. Absolutely. You know, uh, you know, one of the most fascinating aspects of the microbiome world that I've been stumbling upon is indeed how you imprint the, you know, the, the progeny with something that will keep you healthy or not. And the first thousand days of life from conception to the two years of life seems to be instrumental to establish a friendly, you know, mutually symbiotic advantageous relationship with the microbiome. And, and again, anything that derails from plan of evolution, because this didn't come up like this. It was a trying back and forth that brought us to the syndicate of the situation right now. Imagine you, your genome like a piece of marble. Now you need to carve this in a, in a beautiful, you know, uh, you know, sculpture. And it's the microbiome through the environment that will decide, am I gonna have something beautiful coming in here that I can admire when I look at, or it's something that I can even understand what's going on and that will have no function. Once again, I birth, hopefully through the vaginal colonel, you will have the first imprinting, the engraftment of the original microbiome. But that's the beginning of the journey because this has not only to engraft, then they find the right relationship with the host. And this will be eventually reshaped by the breast milk microbiome because mom will continue passing the microbiome through breast milk that together with prebiotics, you know, the uh, human monooligosaccharides that feed specifically part of this farm, you will eventually get into a situation in which genetically compatible microorganism, because it comes from your mom and she selected that, so it should be genetically compatible with you as a progeny, will start that process to establish this friendly relationship. And again, one of the key function of the microbiome is to program the immune system. You know, too many years ago, when the evolution engineered the immune system was engineered to fight only one enemy. There were microorganisms there. There was no cancer at that time. There was no uh, metabolic disorders because the life expectancy was 14 years of age. So either you die of infection, or you die because the dinosaur will eat you. That's it. I mean, there is no alternative to that. And this was until the 1800s when we had, you know, the Pasteur, the Cox, uh, the, you know, and, and all nine yards that will develop, you know, this huge understanding of, you know, uh, infectious disease and so on and so forth, that mainly we were dying of infections. And now, not anymore until Mother Nature will remind us with the COVID-19 that we still have to, face this kind of situation with microorganisms. But all this to say, in the first thousand days of life, it is the microbiome that will decide 
how to program the immune system. If the microbiome is in balance, the, the immune system would be you know, programmed to unleash inflammation. There's nothing else that create a very unfriendly environment for microorganisms. It's too hot, there are chemicals that will kill you and there are you know, cells that will get there to, to eat you and so on and so forth. Only when you really, really are under the attack. Why? Because inflammation, it's something that you will pay a price. That tissue that is in flames will die. The whole organism will survive. So you want the system that unleash inflammation when you really, really need to have, you know, a, a fight with a microorganism and you want to turn this off when this fight is over and won. Yes. That's yes. what a balanced microbiome will teach the immune system to do. But if it's off balance, particularly during this programming time, the first thousand days of life, and what's going to happen, the bar for inflammation will be placed so low that for trivial reason, you generate inflammation. And it's a matter of time. Then on a specific genetic background, that continuous instigations will lead to, you know, break of tolerance and develop of a chronic inflammatory conditions. It can be an autoimmune disease, neurodegenerative disease, or, you know, cancer that will eventually be the consequence, not just because you were genetically predisposed, but the way that, again, you play your genetic cards. Yes, absolutely. And it really impresses the fact that, what someone may get sick with SARS-CoV-2 now and develop something like long COVID, where you really can begin to trace backwards to say, how was your microbiome before that? How was the microbiome of the mother before that? In other words, that the elements that set someone up for chronic disease develop beginning early in life, if not uh, even before they're born. And so by being able to understand those factors, we can better figure out who's going to get sick and of course, how to prevent it, which is key. You know, and beyond that then, we also have the gut brain axis. In other words, the way the vagus nerve that innervates the gut can communicate with the organisms there and convey that signal to the brain in a manner that can drive or you know, influence uh, symptoms in the brain. And also I think you've shown, at least in mice, that perhaps leakage of organism or their products into the blood may even be able to permeate the brain via a leaky blood brain barrier, right? Would you uh, talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, you know, the fact that there was a communication between the gut and the brain is known for a long, long time. We know that the brain can communicate to the gut so much so that, you know, when we're nervous, you know, the, we somatize with stomachache or diarrhea or whatever. What we did not know until the recent past that this is a bi-directional, you know, communication. So the gut can communicate with the brain and therefore you know, that will cause situations that will have consequences in the brain development, the brain function, and eventually neuroinflammation that leads to clinical outcome. What you were alluding to is the fact that, you know, again, again, an, an imbalanced microbiome that leads to activation of the zoning pathway, for example, will allow some metabolites to gain access to the bloodstream and eventually through the blood barrier that also jeopardizes in this situation to, to uh, reach the, the brain and, and create the conditions of neuroinflammation, depending who you are genetically speaking and which part of the brain will be affected. You may develop schizophrenia, you can develop autism, you can develop Parkinson, you can develop a dementia, you know, and, and, and again, I, I believe that we're starting to scratch the surface of a much more complex situation um, you know, again, uh, another book that we call in collaboration with Susie, we wrote a long time ago that had to deal with uh, a celiac disease that uh, it, it's, it's gluten freedom. Uh, there was a, a sentence that I put in there. I didn't know that would become so famous and fashionable. I, I said, you know, the gut is not like Las Vegas. What happened to the gut does not stay in the gut. <laughs> and and I, that, this was decades ago. And it was already clear to me that, you know, the, the ecosystem and the biology of the gut, mainly because it's the largest interface that we have with the environment, may have impingement of so many other functions, including brain function. And, and therefore, you know, again, um, the, I see the future uh, of trying to capitalize all this knowledge um, to really have you know, personalized intervention for specific conditions. This, no matter what kind of condition you're talking about, autism, you know, Parkinson, celiac disease, diabetes, these are final destinations. How you got there is very different from one individual to another. 
and, and pretending that we will have a magic bullet that will fix them all, uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's unrealistic. And that's the reason why we don't have drugs on the market. They have 100% efficacy, it would, would never happen. So the key element is really to understand who we are, how we got there, and then eventually personalize an intervention for you know, a, a precision medicine intervention. But even more ambitious is disease interception. We have a couple of studies, one on CD disease and the other one on autism, in which we follow you know, these kids from birth, even before birth, by the way. And you know, we do ask ourselves how and why some kids starting from the same point, they're all genetically predisposed because they have someone in the family with serious disease or autism. Why some kids will end up to develop disease and some do not? What is the journey? Why genetic editing is gonna be a problem you know, I, I, and I don't see this as a, 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 a solution, but the editing of the expression of, of the, uh, the genes, the ones that ultimately are responsible for disease, that's very feasible if I understand what I'm talking about. And once again, the microbiome seems to be the logical target for me to epigenetic influence the march of an individual. And if we know, as we start, we have published a paper in which in PNS, in which taking only 10 kids with celiac disease and 10 kids that you know um, uh, match controls, rather than do cross-sectional studies, so take you know one quarter of people sick and the other one they are healthy and compare the microbiome. This is very descriptive. We mechanistically follow over time, you know, and the evolution of the microbiome, the ones that develop, the ones that did not, and we were able to predict months before who will eventually would develop celiac disease, who would not, just based on the composition of the microbiome. We, wow. we realized that some of the kids that eventually developed celiac disease lost some protective elements in the microbiome that were present, the one that did not. And conversely, had an enrichment of belligerent components of the microbiome already described before to be associated with autoimmune diseases. If this is yeah. the case, going after these changes may be a way to intercept disease. We'll see. But you know, this will require a huge amount of work a huge amount of data, uh, deep machine learning for you know uh, understanding the modeling, and eventually we're going to get there. Yeah. But you know, I, I, that, I have no doubts about that. I don't know when, if it's going to be next year, in ten years, or, or fifty years, but we will get there. Yeah, that's incredible. That's really, really interesting. I suppose that in addition to, you know, lack of organism in the microbiome that could be helpful, um, you would also have the consideration that there could be some enteric pathogens, not necessarily SARS-CoV-2 that are already skewing it, um, you know, and so I suppose you want a mix of improving the organisms that are beneficial and making sure there's not some other player there. Um, another virus or something that can persist in the gut that can sort of, you know, uh, bring the other organisms along with it to, in a sense, behave more badly. Because I did notice you were making an organoid model um, of the gut and entero, uh, gut entero in a gut infection in a sense. I'm yeah, sure the, word there. the, the yeah. major limitation of all the science of, mm -hmm. of, on the microbiome is that unfortunately, as good as they are, and they're still they are important, the animal models don't fully recapitulate the situation that we see in the GI tract with somebody that has a specific condition like, you know, CD disease or type 1 diabetes or SARS-CoV-2. It does not because the genetic is different, the biology is different, and so on and so forth. The chemistry is different. So a surrogate of the story is to take advantage of the fact that, excuse me, just a second, they take advantage of the fact that you know the 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 the, the intestine has a very active stem cell compartment and is readily accessible by doing an endoscopy i.e you know taking a tube down and taking pieces of your intestine that we do routinely for clinical purposes you can harvest hundreds and hundreds of clips where there are hundreds and hundreds of stem cells and therefore, now it's relatively easy to generate a artificial gut, so to speak, um, from an individual with a specific disease and see how that, you know, organoids interact with a specific component in the microbiome to answer the questions, why I break tolerance to something? Why SARS-CoV-2 is creating this problem? What kind of pathway are activated? And it gives us 
you know, huge leverage on identify possible biomarkers yes. uh, and eventually therapeutic targets. Yes, a great way to learn the mechanism, as you say, of That's what's right. going on. Yeah, definitely. That's really cool. Well, okay. Um, what well, last with long COVID? Um, you said that you are going to be able to run a trial to give Lara. Lorazotide, I don't want to butcher that, to patients with MIS-C. Do you think there's a chance that eventually, it, depending on uh, research with long COVID, that, that would be a potential thing to trial in long COVID? So the limiting factor is money. Yeah, <laughs> Simply always. Said, so we applied to the European Commission for long COVID projects um, in which we have already five areas, including Africa, South America, North America and Europe, where we have the capability to recruit patients mm -hmm. and eventually treat them with larazotide and see what is the impact of these patients compared to one they are not treated in terms of the risk of long COVID. Long COVID, unfortunately, we're still in a learning process. It's not a rare event like missing. Mm -hmm. So we will be able to see a fair number of long COVID cases and therefore, comparing the one they're treated and not treated, we have a sense if lorazidide can ameliorate long COVID as it seems that it's ameliorating this thing. That is very interesting. I hope you get that funding. I hope so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have the infrastructure and we have the next already place put in place. So we have, you know, 12 wow. partners already are ready to go. Good to know. Okay. Well, let's, you know, good. Let's see. Well, this is incredible. It's just been so helpful to speak with you. Honestly, the research, it's just, you've discovered so many key trends of what's going on that already draw from your existing work. I really think that this topic of SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in the guts, the spike protein is a super antigen that can itself drive a lot of path pathological processes on its own. And the intersection of that, obviously, with microbiome, these just vast ecosystems of organisms whose activity matters in any chronic condition, which you've made clear, is very important. In other words, you've been able to correlate these different trends, you know, because sometimes one lab is doing one thing and another lab is studying something else. But what's great with your research is you're actually tying different things, very major topics together in a way that's actionable and actually helping these patients. So it's very exciting to speak with you and I hope that we could touch base in a little bit and I could actually uh, learn where you stand um, down the road when you continue to do this work. Thank you, Emmett. I've been very generous about the view. Of course, this is the results of a huge number of individuals that you know, with great humility um, just dropped whatever they were doing, trying to help with, with this COVID uh, pandemic. So um, I'm just the director of an orchestra and it's a maestro, so the one that really deserve, you know, all the recognition. This is amazing our work. I mean, uh, truly, um, you know, again, uh, um, when you see people that put, a, a, you know, and leverage their, their talents in a situation of, of, of despair as we're facing right now, you know, this, this is very refreshing. So we are excited, of course, and we're looking forward to continue to contribute as much as we can to really ameliorate the impact of COVID-19 on, 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 you know, us as a community. Definitely. All right. Thank you. Thank you Take so care. much. Appreciate it.